record. And we are recording. Yep. Also on this end. Great. So, hey, uh, I guess we are live, and it's time to do the Lean Into Art cast, the audio and video show where a couple of visual storytellers, visual communicators get together and chew on, crunch on, and otherwise masticate a bunch of uh, complex thoughts in, uh, regarding visual storytelling, visual communication, uh, communicating ideas with visuals. Uh, visuals meaning pictures and words, because words are, after all, uh, can be visual. <laughs> sure. So. And they could be made of victuals, which was the word I learned from watching the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> <laughs> victuals. I don't know the etymology of that word. So my, uh, my name is Jersey Droz. The guy over there is Rob Stenzinger. And uh, we're going to start this episode with our curveball. Do you have a curveball ready for me, Rob? Curveball, for those who are new to the show, is where we take a uh, difficult Difficult question, question without a very easy or pat answer, and throw it at the other guy and see. watch them wrestle with the idea and try to come up with some kind of plausible answer for the question. Like a, like a Zen Cohen thing, right? Like a, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Does a dog have Buddha nature? And uh, Rob, you said you had one. <laughs> uh, this one, I suppose it, it, this is way not Zen, and uh, but feel free to clap. It's... Um, <laughs> If you were to, and obviously this is so self-serving, but you know, I, let's let's enjoy this one. So, if you were to uh, provide someone with one lean into art cast to start out with, oh. which one would that be? Uh, uh, define the user, because um, there's two kinds of lean into art casts that I've I found in in our body of work. Um, there's the ones where we delve into useful and uh, applicable topics and there are ones that are just plain out abstract or borderline in the case of the ones that where I bring the topic uh, self-indulgent like uh, the five tips episode where I go into the five things you can learn from watching cartoons come on that's self-indulgence that's just me going like I think cartoons are the greatest and uh, some people may enjoy listening to somebody get really excited about that kind of thing but not everybody does that, that's a limited audience right uh, not everybody wants to hear me go on about my theories as to what could have been done with Rodimus Prime in the Transformers universe. <laughs> no, that that was it. That was cool. I mean, I remember you summed up an entire uh, episode in that in that podcast, yeah. didn't you? It summed up an entire. Um... Uh, season three, uh, episode twenty six of season three, burden hardest to bear. Uh, the final episode before they kicked into Transformers uh, Rebirth, which was a four part miniseries, which, featured, which came right after the return of Optimus Prime, it was the final Rodimus Prime episode, mm -hmm. and it was one of the best ones in my opinion. But yeah, um, other than that, you know, another one that I, I, for the for the more practical minded one, uh, look at my thumbs. I always felt pretty good about that episode. I'll have to look mm -hmm. up the actual episode. Uh, number and date uh, and then art automation which may be art automation part one depending on what we call this episode hmm. yeah, good point. You, you, sh you shared you brought in like a big old dump truck full of great ideas on how to make your workflow go a lot more seamlessly so any of those three are places where I, I, I would actually start with either art, art automation or look at my thumbs where we talk about thumbnailing which I thought that one was pretty good What's really funny though is you mentioned that the uh, it was the five tips episode. Uh, we we got a lot of reaction out of that one. Did I we? think yeah we did. There was um, uh, yeah good talk about it. Uh, just socially social network kind of things. You know people tweeting about it and whatnot. And um, um, I think we even received at least two or three different emails on that one. Hmm. Yeah, that just goes to show how bad my memory is. Uh, maybe we should actually put up a poll uh, from the the leaners. I'm gonna call I'm gonna call the listeners leaners until they come up with something better. Uh, but uh, but maybe we should put up a poll for them to say which episode would you recommend somebody start with, and then we can put up like a page like a new to the show kind of thing. Because now we're in episode 51, 51, almost a year old. Holy cow! So yeah, it's uh, it's pretty wild. I mean it. Um... Yeah, that's right. I suppose 52 is the, the actual anniversary, but um, 50 is the big round number, so I guess we can celebrate uh, twice. So another yeah, pizza. 
But it just it, it what it suggests is that there's a body of of material mm -hmm. there. Though. There's a lot of material, so therefore perhaps it'd be a good idea to put up some kind of page that says, if you're new to the show, here's where to start. Here's some interesting episodes. Skip over the boring ones where Jersey cries. Uh, so did, did, that, did that answer your curveball? Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. Let's... Uh... Okay, I've, I've got a, I've got a, a tricky one. Hmm. Uh, and it relates to, the, to this week's topic. Um, talk about lines in the sand. Talk about borders. Talk about Rubicons, uh, crossing a threshold. When do you know that there's no turning back? When do you know that you've gone from the light to the dark? And uh, this is a show where we talk a lot about learning and a lot about the importance of learning. And learning usually involves picking up new information, processing it, internalizing the stuff that works, and then uh, learning from the stuff that didn't work and proceeding on, right? Uh, learning doesn't happen in a vacuum. Learning doesn't happen in this white space like in the Matrix where you just you know uh, meditate long enough and then the knowledge just comes to you. I forget which, which uh, Greek philosopher thought about that, thought that like learning could be achieved by just thinking really hard. Um, so, stands to reason that uh, collecting tips and resources and tutorials and tools uh, would be assets to learning, yes? Perhaps. Perhaps. Oh, already Rob's measuring his response. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's, that leads into my curveballs. Like, what's the line between collecting assets to learning and asset porn? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, when 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 have you crossed the threshold into? Oh, I need one more fancy pen. I need one more fancy backpack, and then I can take on this learning challenge. You know, I just need to look up one more tutorial. I need to uh, figure out one more layer of of uh, JavaScript coding uh, before I can finally take on the thing. Uh, do, so you know, drawing line in the sand is always a tricky one. But uh, I'm wondering, do you have a assessment or rubric or way to measure when you've gone too far? Well, um, it's, it, it's so funny because uh, I think it can feel really good when you are working at or near this, uh, what's the, the, the topic that you care about so much where it kind of feels like you may be um, maybe you're progressing, maybe you're, um, uh, you're involved with it and that can feel like the right thing to do, even though like maybe nothing, no, no output is happening. And as far as like, detecting a, um, a threshold of like when you can realize you're, you're not, um, not making that progress. Yeah. That is a really, really hard one because, um, uh, it can take an abundant amount of evidence in order to um, in order to realize because it's so subtle. It's like this. It's it's this very tiny layer of sediment that's building up over time of something not occurring, and the sediment is this. Instead of building a a, a chain of experience that involves evidence of stuff you've produced, you're building a chain of avoiding producing and like maybe acquiring some useful skills along the way, but not necessarily putting them to the test enough and completing that thing. And so I'm speaking, well, being someone that essentially, I can argue this, to keep it simple, essentially took me roughly, let's say 16 years to finish my first game and get paid for it. Mm-hmm actual like I produced it I mean there's different lines I can draw there or whatever but like a game that I made as an independent and um, conceived it built it did all that it took a long time and one day I or whatever I, I noticed that I what I, I said well why haven't I finished this because I have also oh, while I'm building the sediment toward um, not finishing the thing that I'm theoretically trying to to um, make an important part of my creative existence, I'm building other experience at the same time. So on one hand, there's this there's a topic I care about a lot, and it's all sediment, and it's just it's not really piling up these things, rough, polished or otherwise. No, nothing's piling up. Um, but then elsewhere, 
things are piling up, and I notice like I am producing and getting things. So I, at some point, it took a long time for me to see that difference. So at, I would say at some point, it's um, different roles. You can cross a line where all of a sudden one role is in such strong contrast. Maybe that's you know a form of cognitive dissonance, right? Where theoretically this is a thing I'm trying to set out to do, and I'm wearing this hat, but you know, am I really pulling it off? Anyway, um, it is from my personal experience. It takes 16 years, so that's how that's how long it takes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the arbitrary number you throw on top of it. Is like uh, Dave Sims, two thousand pages. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell's ten thousand hours. Here comes Rob's sixteen years, son. You know yep. the, the humor in this whole question is that <laughs> is that learning is a complex and sophisticated and subtle thing, right? And there's different kinds of learning styles, learning modalities, whatever you want to call it, and the, the, the joke of collecting articles to make your life better, uh, the, the joke, the humor of the joke is, is that you're not actually doing anything anymore. You're just like collecting all the stupid healthy tips it, to protect yourself against failure. Or like the, 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 that's like something along that, li that, that, that line is protecting yourself against actually having to try and fail and learn from that. And then here I'm asking you for the stupid healthy tip for how to avoid falling into the trap of stupid healthy tips, right? So, the only time you'll notice it's it's like it's like you fall into the trap. You you've made you've set your home in the trap, and you've lived a great existence for a long time until you realize you're in a trap, and then eventually you get out of it. Um, I, and it's just it's interesting because it this is it is so f um, humorously and painfully individual that <laughs> yeah. um, um, like I remember running into someone at um, at the up fair actually. Um, a couple of years ago, that this this was a gentleman who had some polished work. I was laughing and tearing up over this gentleman's body of work he was carrying with him. He would he was adamant about about not sharing it with the world, adamant. And I'm like, really? Like, what what are you waiting for? What's just take pictures of this and post it? I mean, anything. Like, there's what 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 barriers left? And so, um, I don't know. I, I get it, though. At the same time, I'm not trying to be um, harsh. It's just, uh, boy, is that an individual thing. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, and that, that's, that's, I think, uh, an appropriate answer to the curveball. Um, <laughs> not an answer. It's well, well, yeah. I mean, and, and for me, it's when uh, I notice that I'm afraid to get back to the page. That's when I know something's wrong. And, and I mean, like, like when I'm really trying to put, like, I'm, I'm just distracting myself with anything, to, 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 g to keep away from that page. And then I sit down at the page, and I'm like, oh, I just don't want to do this right now. Whoa, that's a warning sign. Um, and usually that's when I have to force myself to get back to it. So, uh, okay, so much then for curveballs. And you know, in future episodes, I will have transition music that we're going to start inserting in here to in indicate the, uh, the Rubicon of uh, moving on to another topic uh, or the main topic for this week and it looks like Rob that we've got an art automation part two ahead of us uh, with a little bit of a twist to it this is kind of like building on what we started last week before I hijacked the whole thing with my talk about that tablet um. <laughs> um, just really briefly uh, do you have any quick update on the tablet um, is it how, how is life going with the uh, <laughs> The Galaxy 10.1. Well, 10 .1. well, yeah, the Galaxy 10.1, uh, the Galaxy Note 10.1, I should say, from mm -hmm. Samsung. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I'm still liking it a lot. I I posted on my Google Plus page. By the way, I got one of those fancy Google Plus URLs. You can now follow me at google.com/slash/plusjerseydrozed. Hey, look at this kid. Um, yeah, Rob shakes his head. <laughs> you no, I think it rocks. That's uh. But that um, is very cool, and um, it's it's nice to be able to throw out that URL for people now, so they can anybody who's listening in the audio. It's just my name, just Google.com plus just my name. I mean the plus symbol. Uh, anyway, uh, I posted a test that I did of doing full Photoshop colors in uh, what is it? Photoshop Touch, I think is what it's called on the Galaxy uh, Galaxy Note. 
And uh, I mean, it's because touch Photoshop touch is, is kind of reconf reconfigured to be more intuitive for a touch interface. Things are in weird places. You know, you don't just have like the palettes like you normally do in Photoshop. It's like everything's buried and nested now. Um, and it's very, I, uh, uses iconography rather than words, right? So like there's like an right. ampersand, you click that or tap that and then a drop down appears with like your paint bucket, your gradient tool. Um, oh, what else is in there? Uh, a couple other different kinds of tools are in there, but then like there's another button you tap over in the up, upper left. There's not like the menu with, you know, file, edit, image, etc. like in Photoshop. So once you get around that, once you figure that out, uh, it went pretty speedy, and I was able to do what I consider to be, you know, equivalent coloring to my, my traditional comics work. Um, so aside from the size limitation of 7 inches or so uh, by 7 inches at 300 dpi, um, and th there is a little bit of weirdness to the Photoshop brush that uh, it, it feels like it's 1,024 levels of pressure sensitivity, but there's a... Um, a very severe drop between really light lines and heavy lines. It switches mm -hmm. really fast with just like the tiniest bit of pressure. And then once you're into heavy thick lines, then uh, there's n it, it's more of a gradual shift in how much how thick the line gets per how much pressure you add. I'm still trying to figure out my way around that. I don't know if it's something with it comes with a bunch of different tips. Um, so I try I switched out the tips with one of the other ones, seeing if that makes a difference. Um, but I got a feeling that it's just that the uh, the the line rendering engine, I guess, or whatever you want to call it in Photoshop, just isn't up to snuff with the desktop version. So I I found that when I'm using lines like inking lines or coloring lines, um, I have to move a little bit slower than I normally would, and and especially after using Manga Studio, where it rewards you for going fast, and I started learning to ink fast on the Wacom tablet. Um, it was it was a little bit like two steps back to kind of work that slow. So, still figuring my way around, uh, figuring my way around it. Um, but then the the other downside is I only get like about an hour a night to really play with it because uh, I got so much work to do. So it's like it's like a before bed thing. I'll play with the thing and try doing a little bit of sketching and inking in it. But I'm still liking it a lot. Super cool. I just wanted a little update because uh, obviously your perspective with that's going to change over time. Yeah. And, uh, I, and, and obviously there's, there's a lot of moving target aspects to it too. And, uh, and plus I'm, you know, currently living vicariously through your experience on that. Well, I saw uh, that you put your device. mod book up for sale. I saw you put your mod book up for sale to possibly replace it with a tablet. Yeah, um, exactly. It's like uh, it, it's kind of like if you're looking for a job in a new city, kind of thing. I'm, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting rid of that uh, that lock-in situation where you know it's kind of like selling your house, right? Yeah. So we'll see. But you know, I, it, when I did the Google Plus post, uh, somebody posted in the comments that there's there's other tablets out there that have pressure sensitivity. There's apparently, um, I forget that. Look it up on my Google Plus feed. I'll put a link in the show notes. But apparently, there's a a PC tablet that's actually 12 inches. Weighs about three, four pounds, I guess, and it runs uh, Windows. What is it? Seven Windows. Mm -hmm. What was it before that? XP. Um, it's been a while since I've lived in the Windows universe. Well, but, there's um, XP Vista Seven, and then that's right, Vista coming up. Vista. Um, but but anyway, so like this guy was saying, like he's running a full version of Photoshop on this, and the device itself only costs two hundred dollars. So you know, what? okay, really, yeah. Look in the comments on that post that I did, uh, which again I'll link to in the show notes for this episode. Hmm. But, um, but yeah, that, and I looked, I, wow, time traveling me just cried a lot because <laughs> I because I bought a Fujitsu tablet back in the day, and uh, that was a lot of dough, <laughs> and uh, it was way not two hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, the times are changing. Yeah, exactly. Well, well that's that's good though. I, I, I did look it up on Amazon. It was indeed around $200. Um, but then my questions are, is what's the battery life like? And what's what's it like lugging around a two, three pound plus device? That's 12 inches. 12 inches makes a difference, right? Um, so, the, you know, one of the things that you always like to say on the show, Rob, is trade-offs, 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 trade-offs. And, you know, so with the tablet, I would define it as it's n not nearly as good as a Cintiq, but it weighs a pound. It's 
It's got an uh, eight-hour battery life, super portable. The thing's light, light as heck. Um, and what? And you're losing screen resolution, but you're you're gaining whack on pressure sense, pressure sensitivity and really really high portability. But if you, you want a bigger screen, you know this is where we got to do. Like you pointed out on the last last week's episode, you just got to do your research, and you got to look at all the specs and these things and ask yourself what you really want. So for me, it's like some people are saying like, oh, the Galaxy Note low resolution screen that matters less to me than being able to draw on the thing you know obviously I'd love to have high resolution too you know what is it it's uh, 1024 by 768 or somewhere in the neighborhood for the resolution that's no, actually higher than that I mean yeah that's it's higher than iPad 1 okay and that, that 1024 by 768 is the iPad yeah. first generation anyway I don't want to belabor the tablet talk no. we can always save that for another episode but but yeah I'll, I'll keep I'll keep reporting in and I, and I plan on doing some more um, Tests and sharing them with everybody so they can see what this thing can do. But uh, the, the the main complaint I have right now is the the lines that when you're painting in Photoshop tend to be a little bit on the wobbly side. But I'm saying that as somebody who's gotten accustomed to Manga Studio and anybody who's inked in Manga Studio knows what I'm talking about in terms of the fluidity of those lines. They're just gorgeous. So, mm -hmm. but this relates to our overall topic because we wanted to talk about you know um, tech tips or tech. Ways we have enhanced our art flow, our uh, expediting our work with different kinds of technology, whether it's software, hardware, different systems, um, and we collected a whole bunch of things. But uh, we're going to start with a thousand feet up, right? Uh, thinking theoretically and abstractly about this thing. What you know, going back to my curveball that I threw at you. You know, there's going to be somebody who says, like, oh, gee, technology, I like to do things the old-fashioned way, just drawing on paper. I mean, that's that's uh, time-tested. Um, I don't need to seek out software enhancements for what I'm doing. Uh, I'm guessing anybody who has that position probably isn't listening, although they might be, because you, you the person who has their host on the ground a lot of times has the ear going like this, you know, leaning in and going like, <laughs> I don't want to do it, but tell me more. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I'm curious, I want to start with, I want to lead off with this question, Rob. Um, you know, I find it's a habit for me nowadays to constantly look for new things to try and new software services and new kinds of uh, tools and tech. Like, that's how I found out about the Galaxy Note. Um and I can't remember where that habit came from, if I was always that curious or if it's something that kind of like grew naturally. So my question for you first is, do you think that people are just predisposed to search for this stuff or do you think that this is like a learned behavior that you can pick up on? Um, in, well, other words, in other words, are you predisposed to be a good learner or, or in, uh, a curious learner, I should say. Not a good learner, but a curious learner. Uh, or is this something that can be uh, cultivated? I, I think without a doubt it can be cultivated. I think we learn a lot by noticing new things that are uh, different in, 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 well, we, we had a whole episode that we were talking about um, um, sort of people that we respect and whatnot. So if you're, if you're watching the YouTube channel of someone you respect and you notice, oh, what's, th and they're using an app that you're really fami you're familiar with and all of a sudden they veer off of a familiar course and they pull up some kind of uh, tool palette that you're not aware of, chances are you are going to wonder, especially if they get great results out of it, uh, you'll be curious. You'll want to check it out. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I think learning by, learning by example and uh, curiosity based on uh, seeing what excellent things other people do can easily lead to it. It doesn't, even, it doesn't have to be uh, um, like some self-discovering thing. I'm trying to think back to when I was first starting digital coloring or digital toning and digital lettering in comics, which would be way back in, oh my gosh, was it really 2000? Oh my gosh. Um, and I, I didn't know the first thing about it. You know, I, I, most of what I knew about Photoshop I learned through playing with Photoshop, which is actually, you know, we did a, an episode on learning through play. Uh, and I'm a big fan of that, you know, part of my uh, two-hour Photoshop class that I teach every year at the Ann Arbor District Library, there's a component where I walk them through a bunch of things, get them introduced to the tools, and I say, okay, now we're going to play for 20 minutes. I just want you to goof around and make a mess out of that page. 
uh, because by going what's that, you're going to introduce yourself to new tools in a way where that's quite different and apart from me saying, this is the paint bucket, the paint bucket works so and so, right? Um, but that said, when I was faced with the deadline, okay, now they want me to color this book, it's on a deadline, uh, how am I going to do this? And, you know, I started just building these files that had 40 or 50 layers on them, putting each panel, each panel had like 10 layers where I was putting each color element in its own layer for no logical purpose other than, well, you just put lots of layers, that's all. Um, do you think you were trying to prevent yourself from failing though too, by having all those layers? It's like a... Probably. Yeah. Probably, probably I wanted I wanted to keep some editability in there, but I didn't know how to edit that well yet because I was doing stuff where I was doing gradients of foreground color to transparent, and then all of a sudden wondering why when I clicked with my magic wand tool on that light on, on that color it didn't select the whole color anymore. It's like of course, but it's it's a full gradient spread. How come it's not? Oh, because I used foreground to transparent. I didn't know that yet. Yep, sure. Um, and I was doing this on a Windows ninety eight Hewlett Packard <laughs> PC with a two gigabyte hard drive. <laughs> Wow, it wasn't even top of the line for two thousand. You know, it was it was a weak, weak machine. So yeah, I had a lot of crashes, had a lot of failures, and trying to color the stuff, and a lot of frustration. Um, and then the guys at Antarctic Press gave me this uh, book they published on how to color, digi- how to color comics digitally. And I remember cracking it open and flipping through it, and there was this whole section on using channels, which I'd never done before. I'd never even thought about channel. What are channels in in color? You know, and so I'm I'm starting to try, trying to get the gist of it, and then eventually it just became opaque to me. I was just like, I don't even know what I'm reading anymore. Book, close the book. I'll just keep doing it the way I'm doing, it and I'll figure it out on my own, right? I don't need a manual. Uh, and I kept crashing and crashing and crashing. I kept, and I remember, um, and this is where I got a question to pitch at you. Is uh, I remember there was one illustration I was working on. It was for the comic PPV. And it was the little furball aliens with the robotic arms and legs for those six people out there listening who have actually seen the book. Um, and I wanted the lines to be a different color. I wanted them to be not black. I wanted to do color holds, but I didn't know what col- color holds were yet. But I'd seen them. I'd seen them in comics. As you know, people do it where like the metal will have a different colored line around it. Okay, well, how? And I started to reason it out. How do they? Fi- how do they do this? Well, maybe they're using the magic wand tool. Well, this is a grayscale image. Or it's an RGB image, but it's a raster image. So when I use the the magic wand tool, it's not getting all the right pixels. I didn't know the difference between the clicking on and off contiguous when doing a magic wand selection. So okay, well I guess I'll go in with the lasso tool and trace around those lines pixel by pixel, and spending hours on this. And then even then, when I did the fill of the color, it didn't look right. It didn't look natural. Okay, well, I'll mess with some different layers. I'll drop some color in some different layers, and I'll use different blending modes to try to get it to interact with the black lines in different ways. Oh, now it's interacting with the colors underneath the black lines. What a mess. And I just happened to be talking on the phone one night with a coworker from a place I was working. And I was telling her about this frustration I was having. I'm like, I don't get it. How do they do it? And she's like, dude. And she pointed me to, I think it was a DeviantArt tutorial. Was DeviantArt even around back then? Maybe. It's, uh, been, it's Actually, it's been around a long time. So I think it might have been on DeviantArt, uh, yeah. but it was a tutorial on how to do color holds, how to use the channels palette to knock out the whites and isolate the black lines on its own transparent layer and then lock transparent pixels so you can paint on the lines. Mm-hmm. And it was like a revelation. It was like you know the 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 angels sang when when I read that tutorial, and my life was never the same. You know, uh, but I didn't go seeking it out. I mean, like it didn't occur to me at that time to go Google dot com uh, or whatever was around back then, Lycos, uh, Ask Jeeves, or whatever was the popular search engine. Alta Vista. Alta Vista. Um, but it didn't even occur to me just to do a simple search for a tutorial on the darn thing, right? Uh, it took my mm-hmm. friend kind of giving me this advice, and it took me hitting a brick wall and sort of screeching in frustration until somebody helped me. I'm curious, do, do you have any stories like this, or, or were you just like you were always kind of aware that, you know, go to your library or go to your local search engine to find this stuff? Because it wasn't, it wasn't immediately apparent to me. That's the part when I look back. I'm like, I, I want to go back in time and kick myself in the butt. Like, what were you thinking, kid? Well, let's see. I mean, I know I've... Um, it's 
it's tough because well here one example that came to mind that uh, that's of a different nature but I'll see you I, I know I, I've hit brick walls before but I I guess I'm always curious to see who's doing something awesome and for instance I had a coworker um, a long time ago that I it, it's, it's just interesting he was he's was, he was a person is I mean still around or whatnot and he's a very skilled programmer and I was occupying both a you know a creative and technical hybrid you know web guy role, and um, but this guy was you know programmer. I mean he had his own sort of um, um, Microsoft hybrid one that had the little trackpad in the middle, and he had a chair set up and it was specific height. And this guy was into his ergonomic workstation, and when he sat into it. Things would happen at light speed on his computer, and um, he would rarely touch mouse and whatnot. And I was like, "How in the heck are you doing all this stuff so fast?" And I noticed like he uses keyboard shortcuts all the time. And so, someone coming from a Linux world and and whatever VI and Emacs and all that would be just like, "Oh, so what? We do that." Um, but if you're coming from a Windows background and you see someone doing that, it's it's not so obvious. Um, so it wasn't obvious to me. I was having sort of friction with some of these things that I didn't realize I was having because then I saw this guy just cranking through menus and whatnot. And um, I mean, sure, I used like cut and paste, but uh, especially when it comes to text editing. So if you're doing a lot of writing or you're doing a lot of coding, and there's just a lot of cool, really quick shortcuts. The equivalent, I would say, to what you're describing with Photoshop. So, with I, I when I'd go, let's see. So I would learn, you know, keyboard shortcuts, and I'd be into, you know, trying to get get faster at things. And and uh, it was totally due to seeing that guy um, crank out work. He actually is he he also exposed me to something called, um, about uh, code generation too. So that's a concept where you can configure some instructions and then cause a program to get built without the same amount of effort as it would take to develop every single little part of that on your own. Um, kind of like a macro approach to programming. And wow. so, yeah, a lot of, um, uh, and it's not necessarily a best practice nowadays because, I mean, part of some of those adaptations, and this ties back to the visual world too, um, but some of those adaptations became less important over time as coding environments got better at dealing with what these workarounds were trying to avoid, right? Or what you were trying to accomplish with the workaround. So specifically, he had a, a he could generate a data centric program. So like the the classic create, update, list, delete program. So he could make a quick uh, access database and uh, have it be like a phone directory or have it be a uh, task list, right? Wow. And click a button, boom, it's generated and he's got a website, right? And, and so like I'm just seeing like, wow, I mean you can really come up with these formulas and approaches to automate stuff. Now the process you're describing in Photoshop, that I had, let's see, less of uh, I didn't work often with people who who um, had a bunch of those kind of that level of trickery regarding the visual tools, right? Um, once in a while, but not as often. But where you're describing is is like uh, um, something I think is worth highlighting is this stuff changes because the tool makers notice stuff that people are doing to work around um, inefficient parts of their app. And the um, gives them ideas as far as oh well like Photoshop at some point added the um, um, the mask um, uh, what was it the um, well it, it quick mask the, the quick mask and it also added the um, um, oh what was that you said the the uh, the where you yeah the line masking essentially the uh, oh color holds uh, color holds right. yeah, yeah the I mean that's click, click, click. I I know the I know the effect that it does, um, and I know what button to click in the layer palette. But I don't know. I don't even know the name of the technique offhand, actually. 
it, it, it's it's actually in the channels palette, and yeah, I forget what the what the actual button is called. Now that I think about it, I just know it by its symbol because it's like a reflex to just go to it now. And actually, after Ryan Estrada is in the chat of ryanestrada.com, and after talking with him, uh, I've learned to uh, use the actions palette to automate that stuff now. So I've got a simple shift F14 that takes my scan, converts it to grayscale, runs some levels on it to turn it into pure black and white, and then go to the channels palette, isolate the white pixels, illuminate the white pixels, lot transparent pixels, fill with black. So one button push, and I've got my line art ready to be colored. So That that rocks. That's a good. That's a good uh, example automation. And yeah. now notice how Photoshop includes the actions palette. So which it did not originally. Exactly, and and so these adaptations keep changing over time. Um, it's not like I, I I run into this commonly where you know people from different backgrounds say, oh, so and so designers don't need to code, and visual artists don't need to you know know how to program or whatever, but mm -hmm. that kind of thinking uh, does exist commonly in the community, enough so where it's a part of a, um, a, a product that's as common as Photoshop. Yeah. It wouldn't be there if pe no one was using it. True. Uh, I don't think we need to go into the whole debating, the whole topic of sticking to your knitting or anything like that. I think we've made a pretty strong case for, you know... No, I'm, oh, yeah, I wasn't yeah trying to broach that. I mean... No, 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 obvious, but... but I, I felt I felt the winds shifting in that direction, and I wanted to hoist the mainsail and turn against it. Um, so, okay, well, I want to get to some on-the-ground stuff in just a minute here, but I'm curious if you have anything to... Actually, I, I'll, I'll speak for you, Rob, because <laughs> I know people like to have people speak for them. One of the things that you said to me once, actually, you said this to me many times, is that whenever you see yourself performing a repetitive task, profoundly annoys you and you're the next thing you want to do is figure out how to not have to do that thing over and over again again right um, did, is that do you, it, was that a result of picking up more and more tips to where you realized I don't gotta put up with this stuff anymore yeah I mean it's it's the uh, the satisfaction of, of um, being able let's see to enjoy the uh, problems that engage more of my brain and my skills, and I, I just expect that now. Uh, when I when I when I use the computer, I expect to be able to do interesting things and not mundane things. Mm. So when you're when you're coding, you're not uh, manually moving the cursor up to the line, scroll, 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 move it up the line, and then. Uh, Put the cursor on the the line of text you want to delete, and go delete, 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 and then start typing a new line by hand. Like the way Tom Hanks wrote emails in "You've Got Mail." I don't know if you ever watched that movie. I probably did. I don't. I. It was it. Was he? Was he a hunt and peck typer? Well, and also he was a delete, 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 delete guy. And I'm watching it going, just hold it down, or just drag and select, and then hit delete. Exactly, or yeah, command shift left arrow, um, <laughs> or yeah, or shift home on on uh, Windows. But if you do uh, shift home on on uh, uh, OS X, you're going to select your whole darn document. So uh, the other thing that changed for me once I started picking up on different kinds of ways that technology could help me with my art is that I noticed I got it helped me break that whole preciousness about the art. Um, hmm when I was doing everything by hand and mapping out all my perspective by hand and when I was inking every line, like doing all the black and white line values on the paper so that, uh, you know, you could either shoot it with an offset camera or you could scan it on a 2400 DPI scanner. Um, once I broke free of that and started automating a few things, I found that, well, it's actually pleasurable to just ship the thing, get it out the door. And that pride of spending an inordinate amount of time with a piece of art diminished a little bit because the pleasure of to use that term that everybody likes to use in the internet shipping right D delivering the thing is far greater than the pleasure of laboring over something i find even though you know we've talked in the past about like the joy is in the work itself 
but uh, there's a point where I think I was enjoying the notion that people knew I worked hard on it. Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, if, if you're in one mode, it seems that, um, let's see, uh, uh, the the goal shifts, right? So what, in, in, on one mode, the goal is to in, um, purely improve based on probably a, a set of measures that are independent of economic forces and whatnot. It's probably, I just want to feel like I'm purely increasing my skill and those that I respect in the industry would observe my skill growing. Mm. Yeah, uh, where the other way is just well, I get to eat now because I can get paid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is you know that's pretty satisfying too. That, that's incredibly satisfying. Uh, the, the, you know, I still get giddy every once in a while when I get to buy groceries with with money that I got for drawing something for somebody. That that's a very satisfying feeling, and it doesn't go away. I, I'm not jaded yet. So, um, you ready to go on the ground? You ready to get back down out of these clouds and talk about some practical, uh, useful applications of this stuff? Like, what are we talking about here? Yeah, definitely. Because I have discovered recently, I know it's been around a while, but I just recently discovered uh, IFTTT, if this and that. It's IFTTT.com. Mm -hmm. have you, were you aware of this for a while, Rob? I had been, but I haven't had a, a, a great use case for it. I, I, you know, they, they keep expanding the things that they can help with but uh, I'm just getting to the point where oh okay they're they're now like so I, I, th I get the the feel that you actually have been using it a bit longer because of that because I, I, I wasn't wowed with like oh look at all these shortcuts I can quickly achieve here well um, see this, this is where you know you might be at more of an advantage than than I um, because you know some I mean because you know things like like uh, was it Sukuli I see that you got Sukuli on your list is that the oh, one that, you, that, bet, you bet I'm <laughs> mentioning Sukuli yeah, you mentioned this one before. Uh, this that's the one where you can actually it watches your desktop and it visually interprets changes in your desktop and performs actions based on those changes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you you yeah you've you've got a, quite a few different uh, automation guns in your bandolier there. Um, not having messed around with Sakuli, um, you know, I, I I guess I'm I might be easier to impress by this stuff. But yeah, is if this then that is is this really awesome intuitive online application where it, they, they call them recipes uh, and it, it's it's something you've talked about in some of your um, in your leading to art workshops Rob is that you know it's, it's a simple principle of if this happens perform this task if this happens then do that sure. and it's a yeah it's a logical condition yeah okay that, that's the proper term for it logical conditions I'm gonna write that down um, but what the first thing I start doing with it is just like life stuff. It's like, okay, well, I want an alert from the National Weather Service if severe weather is coming my way. And so if the National Weather Service issues a severe, you know, severe weather uh, warning of some sort, text me. Text me that thing so I know, right? Dumb stuff like that. But then I started looking into more and more recipes, and there's, there's thousands of recipes you can just, that are already made by other users that you can just look up. Uh, and apply to your own thing, and so like I've got it set up to like archive my stuff for me. Like anytime, because like I'm posting stuff all over the place, posting up on Google Plus, posting stuff on Tumblr, uh, Instagram, etc. And it occurred to me that you know, I know a lot of these services offer the ability to download all of your history from them, but when do when do you get to do it? Do you go and do that, Rob? Do you ever? I mean, maybe you do, but do you ever go to these sites and go like, well, I'm going to do a backup of everything I posted to this service? I used to with Tumblr. Tumblr released a backup tool. Mm. And um, I was a regular user of that for a short while, but then I fell out of the habit. See, that's the thing. You got to remember to do it, right? Exactly. And so uh, sometimes automations need to be automated because yeah, they... Uh, uh, automations need to be automated. <laughs> well, the, what's, and what's funny is there's I, some are like very temporary for me where I'll, I'll automate something once and I'll never come back to it or, um, or then realize that, well, if in order for this to really stick around, it's got to, it, it needs to do a job daily or, or on some recurring interval. Right. In order to stick around. So you're, you're using this to, to do some backup and whatnot. Um, I was, I've thought of, um, playing around with this to um, like, okay, so if this and that, essentially you, you pair up things 
So you have a you have an incoming channel and then an outgoing action, right? Right. And uh, the the condition is on the incoming channel typically, um, if something related to it, like it could be um, in your Twitter feed, you favorite something, or it could be um, just that you post something somewhere, Twitter, Posterous, Tumblr. Uh, it can watch RSS feeds. It can watch um, Google Reader. And that's where I'm curious because um, Google Reader is a pretty sweet tool that um, about every other week I go nuts in it, just catching up on a bunch of things, maybe even once a month. But um, I know when I was in a mode of uh, when I'm hunting for a contract, I really use the heck out of Google Reader. And I thought if, you know, well, I, I, I could easily see uh, doing some automation related to that to, you know, fine-tune things that I'm looking for. So instead of me wasting time reading all these disparate sources, I could funnel them through uh, Google Reader and then uh, have uh, this tool, you know, watch for keywords or what have you, or watch watch my folder where those things appear um, and yeah. alert me. Or, yeah. The only thing that stopped me from doing that, because I'm using Pinboard for that kind of thing, which is one of the tools I had on my list here, um, was I was so nervous about giving, if this, then that, a third party access to any of my Google products. Uh, <laughs> and this may be like me turning old and being like, I'm poking the icons and nothing's happening, but I am just so skittish about giving anything access to my Google credentials now or Google products of, of any kind just because oh, of security. I hear you. I mean, it's certainly a, a high concern for me as well. I I clicked on the initial thing as an experiment, assuming I wasn't going to um, continue through with it. It seems that the permissions are granular um, because the, okay. the Google Reader... Um, channel or what, what do they call it in if this then that uh, they call it a uh, and they call yeah, it channel okay, so channel yeah um, it uh, it only showed uh, reader permissions so and and, and being a, a user of, of various Google services like I mean for a while I was hosting on Google App Engine and you know I've, I've got an I've got an app in the market I mean they, they have some granularity to their permissions where um, it's not like you log in once and everywhere works and recognizes the other's um, authentication of you and whatnot. So I had a hunch that it might be granular. Anyway, so yeah, it, but at the same time, it's a little bit... To have that behavior and not take it seriously that you are being a bit risky is, it, is extremely risky. <laughs> so I think your stance is, is, is very wise. You've got to be careful with that. Well, at the same time, I you know, it's like I don't know. These days, I don't know if I'm being that guy who's like, uh, I don't want any viruses on my site. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, then just make sure your WordPress software is up to date. But but if if somebody sends me an email, I might get a virus on my site. I don't want to be that guy. But at the same time, yeah, <laughs> I, I just I I that, that's you know so much of my life is wound up in that Gmail account that I just it scares me to associate it with anything. But I'll, I'll go ahead and give it a try and see what permissions it asks for. I guess that's just the rule, right? Is like when we talked about this last time. I think about like entering the Android universe is just pay attention to what permissions each application is asking for. And uh, and realize that there's there's always some amount of trust you're you're dealing with and you're giving out, and it's worth valuing that a lot. Um, and Actually, it's I, it's worth being disciplined. Where if you're not using it, shut it off. Yeah, I mean, come back to it and shut down your account. I mean, if you're experimenting with something something that um, that isn't continuing. So uh, the other thing is on Google, I believe. Oh gosh, I don't know what it is, but uh, I know there's a URL where you can go revoke permissions and whatnot. Yeah, um, yeah, it's in, it's in your account settings. If you just go to you know like log into any Google thing, like your G Gmail or your Reader. And you go to your little icon in the upper right of the screen, uh, and you click on that, and there's a drop down to go into your account settings, and you can right. revoke permissions under the security tab. Okay. Yeah, I, I went into that recently, and I was astonished by how many things had permission to my account. I was like, revoke, revoke, revoke. <laughs> I went down the whole list. I was like, I can't believe it. It was years ago I gave permission to, the, uh, to this before I was using Google so extensively. Mm -hmm. So anyway, 
Um, so yeah, if this then that, you can use it for just simple, um, you know, recipes to automate certain things about like if I post a picture to Instagram, copy it and paste it or post it to Flickr too. But then I'm also using it as a way to back up files, anything that I'm sending out on the internet, anything that I'm like, I'm documenting or rather archiving everything that I'm sharing online as another backup on top of what kind of backups I run from home, like my external backup and my uh, online backups. So that gives me a little bit more uh, setting my mind at ease. Um, but uh, then I did you want to switch to one of yours? Did you want to talk about Sekuli? Because that's similar to uh, if this then that in the sense that it uses conditional logic to perform automated oh. actions. Yeah, I mean, and Sekuli has uh, has more than the, your basic conditional logic. It has, uh, I mean, it's a full programming environment. It's essentially a um, uh, they call it visual programming, and it was a project at the MIT Media Lab, and it's it's an open source thing available at sukuli.org. It runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. And uh, let's see. So it essentially you would need to become familiar with with coding, the idea of like a variable, conditional logic, loops, but it's not hyper important to um, I think you could, you could uh, really baby step your way through uh, making an automation with, with Sekuli, for instance, like uh, um, I, made a, I made one, I made progress toward the process that I used to set up new users at Lean Into Art the other day. And uh, for instance, one of the tools I use to help uh, generate the passwords is the um, uh, the the uh, grc.com passwords page, right? Steve Gibson worked really hard to build a high entropy um, generator of random data, essentially. That's received plenty of scrutiny that I trust, and I thought, well, um, and this is silly because I could achieve it a bunch of different ways, but um, since I had started using that as part of the manual process, I used it, it when I started to automate it. So, um, I, I, you, you start out with Sekuli and you're, um, okay, I need Sekuli to know if my web browser is open. Well, so you, def it, you can define an app. So I'm like app equals, you know, Google Chrome in quotes and parentheses, right? So I'm, because mm -hmm. I'm telling the app, uh, I'm making a, an app object basically. Then I, then I tell it to open and then I tell it to um, focus on that app. And so I know, like, Google Chrome is open and it's in it, 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 it's the frontmost window. And now I can start having this app look for visuals to um, behave in a similar way if I break down what am I doing. So when I open up Chrome, oh, I go to the address bar and I type in this address, you know, HTTPS, grc.com slash passwords, right? Mm-hmm. And then I need to wait until the page is loaded. So then I would tell Sekuli to wait until, um, and I then you, then built into it, you just literally um, you can type in the command or, or which is calling a function in in the, the that toolkit that it is. You say wait, and then instead of like numbers or letters inside the the, the parentheses, you put a screenshot in there, and Sekuli looks for that on the screen. And it's gonna wait for that. And if and if it has a built-in timeout, and you're like, oh, okay, no, really, wait like five. Don't wait that long. Wait only this long. Or hey, wait two minutes. Wait an hour. Sukuli's gonna hang out and watch your screen for however long you tell it to. And then you say, okay, Sukuli, go click, right? And in fact, and then, and so when I say click, yep, I do another screenshot in there, right? And then if I say, wait a minute, I don't want Sekuli to click right on the center of that image. I want Sekuli to click over here. And so every single little screenshot you embed into Sekuli is uh, a chance to, where you can fine tune, like, oh yeah, do a double click here, or click like 100 pixels to the right and 20 pixels down. Oh, this, act, this, this raises the question, Rob. Yeah. So you got to make sure that your browser window is open when you set Sekuli to watch it, because it's yeah. going to look for exact screen coordinates. It's not just going to go, oh, it's the bottom left of the browser window, no matter what size it is, right? 
that's one way to automate stuff too. But uh, no, Sakuli is actually looking for the um, you. It uh, that's that's where they built in some smarts where 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 that where I mentioned that app object, right? So you can say, um, I suppose I could just share my screen here. Um, essentially, let, let's say, let's say I'm typing a line of text and I say. Um, I, the word Chrome, I say Chrome equals space, capital A for app, parentheses, and then I then open quote, the name of the app as my system recognizes the app, which is just Google space Chrome, end quote, close parent. So now I have this crosswalk where, where Sekuli can, can both talk to my computer um, through launching apps, without using the mouse and whatnot, and it can also use the mouse and, and watching the screen and whatnot. So Sekuli can do both because the secret there, um, it can go really deep because it actually is, uh, the code you're typing is Python. And so if you are familiar with Python, you can start to incorporate tons of other things. Like um, I made one, an automation the other day that uh, I was doing a, a card sort study at um, at work and I had I, I was fine-tuning the list of cards so I just used a, um, um, a set of um, um, essentially a, a, a phrase and then a new line a phrase and then a new line and I put that inside of quotes and then I had it um, I, I turned it into a Python list as a variable so if I wanted to rewrite and, and that powered what Sekuli did, which was it went and made a list of PowerPoint slides that became the cards I used in the card sort study, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a whole bunch of actions that Sekuli did, but it, in that, in its, uh, but it's, its loop that it, when it was running through those 10 steps that it needed to do to create every slide and whatever based on the words I gave it, it was powered by that list of words. So if I'm like, oh, I changed the vocabulary, you know, I need to, you know, add 10 words and take away two, rerun the Sekuli macro, out comes a new PowerPoint and, and um, I can print up new cards and, and um, cool. yeah, run and grab a soda while it does it. <laughs> but obviously, I mean, it goes without saying that you also have to leave your machine running in order to do this, this isn't something where it's going to like boot up your machine for you and then perform these tasks while you sleep, like like the Keebler Elves or anything like that. Uh, yeah, exactly. So Sekuli is it's definitely um, it's acting on your behalf in a style similar. Here's why it's I think it's more learnable than some other scripting approaches is mm -hmm. that it's got that visual angle. So you're literally taking a screenshot. You're like, yep, okay, and it's built into to, to the Sekuli environment where you say, yeah, um, I want you to click. And then all of a sudden, Sekuli switches into screenshot mode, and you go and you drag over something on your screen, and then, poop, then bam, that pops into your your code. Um, it's pretty pretty amazing, very flexible tool. And they have, oh, and for there was one I, I think I mentioned this before, but they even had um, they've got examples, of course, that you can download. Those are free as well. Uh, one of their examples actually plays Angry Birds. And it's not like super artificial intelligence, but what it's doing is it means that Sekuli can identify a bird and then drag it and then let go. And then... Wow. Sl exactly. Um, uh, pretty crazy. Um, it's, it's a very... It's, because it's so visual, I think it, that, that'll help um, visual storytellers um, have, a, have a chance at... Uh, uh, starting to get a grasp on that automation. They have another one that essentially just watches a web page for when your bus arrives, right? So, you know, hey, Sekuli, launch a web page and, and watch this map because my, you know, my hometown happens to have a, you know, a, a web-enabled bus system, right, where, we, where you know where they are. And, and, and that bus is a certain symbol, and when it's in a certain place on the map, Sekuli is going to know that, and then it can respond. So it can text me or whatever. Oh, uh, that's cool. That's super cool. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's a bit of a contraption, but there's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, um, keeping on the topic of, uh, on the theme of automation, before we get into a few other tools, um, 
Have you heard about the Do Share Chrome plugin? No. Oh, cool. I know something you don't know about. All the I time. To, I get to do this. No, no, I don't don't spoil my victory. Uh, so I, f- I found this. I got this by way of Guy Kawasaki, who is, does spends an inordinate amount of attention on uh, Google Plus. He wrote a book called What the Plus, which I guess I should give a plug to. Uh, mm-hmm. Writing that down, What the Plus. He's actually going to be one, the closing keynote speaker at a local event in the Twin Cities that I, I hope I get a chance to get to the market, uh, uh, Minnesota Inter- Interactive Marketing Association uh, event. And actually, Jane McGonigal is the uh, opening keynote speaker, and Guy Kawasaki is the closing keynote speaker. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm hoping I get a chance to get to that. So it's safe to say that you're going to Plots. Uh, Minnesota Interactive <laughs> Marketing? Yeah, MIMA. M-I-M-A. Okay. Just grabbing that for the show notes. Cool. Um, but anyway, so Guy Kawasaki, he posts several times to Google Plus a day, like upwards of eight or nine times a day. And, uh, you know, he's he's a content curator. He's always looking for interesting content, sharing all sorts of different things. Um, but he uses this Chrome plugin called DoShare, which allows him to schedule his posts so that he can just load up the gun first thing in the morning and just set it to go to, re- to fire off every couple hours while he's out doing other things. But you, you look like you just thought of something. Oh, gosh. There's another one that um, I, I started to play with, but uh, I haven't. It's been a, a bit wonky. I, does this one work? Have you tried it? Do you share? Yeah. Cool. I've used, it, I've used it for a couple of posts now. It works great. Um, it does. It, 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 I had some issues with using it to post video posts, but I haven't, I, I'll, I'll try it again. But um, but if you're posting, like, you know, one of the things that they say, like, you're supposed to post images with your posts, uh, all those whole you shoulds with thou shalts with using different content delivery mechanisms. But, uh, you know, if you're just doing a photo post with a few links embedded in, in there with some, you know, a regular text post, uh, it works beautifully. And you can schedule, you know, several posts a day. So, when, you know, I was, I've been posting a lot about Raina Telgemeier's book, uh, drama coming out this coming Saturday, and so you know when I was feeling all hot and bothered about, I gotta help, I gotta help promote this book. Uh, I just queued up three or four different posts through DoShare, and then got out of my system and didn't spam Google Plus all in one day with like ten posts about the book. I was like, okay, well I can sk- space these out. Um, so I don't use it for all my posts, but it does, and especially like uh, there's another post I can put put point people at with uh, Mike Elgin on Google Plus who shared a tutorial on how he uses it to pump out content to all of his other social media sites which some people say is a no-no some people say it's fine but I use it to pump my Google Plus content to some other sites um, so between his tutorial and then do share you could essentially like do all your social posting or your blogging first thing in the morning and then just walk away from the internet for, for the rest of the day and get stuff done well, yeah, I, I'm I'm sold on that. I mean, it's a there's another one the that conceptually competes with it, and it seems really cool. But I don't know if I was just having a problem with it because maybe it, it has a few bugs in Chrome. But it's uh, it's called Buffer, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, like the idea of of making a content buffer. You know, you have a, you have a stack of things that that lies yeah. in wait, but you don't share them all at once, and. Um, I just was I, I wasn't able to get it to uh, totally work for me, but um, you know I have I have it installed. I you know, I signed up for the service and all that, and um, theoretically, it you know with the with the um, it, Chrome extension, it actually adds buttons here and there to websites that it it's it integrates with. So like Twitter or Facebook, where you can say buffer this instead of posting it right away. Yeah, do share does that with Google Plus. Okay. So yeah. It, you automatically get this do button that says send to do share when you're doing a post. So you can you can type up your post as if you're about to send it, and then you hit that other button instead, and it fires it off to that buffering service, right? Cool. That's super neat. Um, the other one that I wanted to uh, touch base on because we got we got to get moving to uh, takeaways and closing out this episode. We're already mm-hmm. at an hour. Um, but you know, when we were talking about doing research last week, and like how I did, all, uh, you know, my share of research on the the tablet that I wound up getting, uh, how did how did I get that information? Well, how did I even trip upon the darn thing? Um, so every night I lay in bed, it's hard for me to go to sleep immediately, especially when I'm stressed out about work. 
right? And what I got to do tomorrow? I'm going through the list over and over my head. Here's all the things got to get done tomorrow. And oh my gosh, I'm not gonna be able to fit that in eight hours. And then that can just get you all wound up and you can't sleep. Or if you do fall asleep, you're gonna have terrible nightmares. At least I do. I always have stress nightmares about my cat. Like she's running into the yard and there's snakes everywhere and I'm trying to get her away from the snakes, you know? And it's <laughs> usually because I'm stressed out about work. Um, so the way I like to unwind is I keep a couple different, you know, thought-provoking books by the bedside. Like, for instance, this book that I mentioned last week, right, Stumbling on Happiness, which is an interesting book on psychology. Or everybody keeps their phone by the bed. Phone's first thing you grab in the morning, right? It's like, it's like uh, was it Paul Tompkins who did the joke about the rocket pack? If we ever get the rocket pack, it'll be the, the, the last thing we think about before we fall asleep. And the first thing we think about when we wake up in the morning, because we're going to be so excited about that rocket pack. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the rocket pack, but we got these fancy phones. So my phone's always by my side. So, you know, I, I open up Flipboard, and which is a great, pretty news aggregator like Google Reader. You know, I can pump in. I've got a comics channel. I pump in a bunch of comics news. I can punch in a bunch, uh, pump in a bunch of technology news, and then I just flip through it casually in the evening or in, in, while I'm laying in bed trying to sleep, and then I do that until I get tired enough to fall asleep. But invariably, I'll come across two or three different articles that, you know, it's like, oh, I'll have to remember that one. Oh, I better grab that one. Uh, well, well, how am I going to grab this one? Um, so Pinboard and Evernote both have the ability to uh, receive emails from you, and all these different readers have the ability to send, to email the article to somebody. So I just set those up in my contacts list. If you go into your Evernote settings, you can get the Evernote address, the email address to post to Evernote. There's also I also pumped it into my Google Plus, so I could also share it to a private circle on Google Plus, which will get pumped into Evernote if I want to do it that way. And there's an email that you can get for um, Pinboard, which is another social book bookmarking service, but that one costs money. I think it's like nine dollars and some odd cents to sign up for it. Uh, why are you shaking your head? No, I'm just. This is yeah. Uh, this is cool. So, and but this and this relaxes you somehow. I'm just wondering. Well, no, no. What relaxes me is just reading the news. But here I am. I'm just about to drift off to sleep, and all of a sudden I come across a really cool article with that's an interesting thing that I'm going to want to follow up on tomorrow. If I mm -hmm. shut this phone off and go to sleep, it's gone. It may as well have never existed. If I don't capture it on a piece of paper or in my Evernote, it might as well have never have existed to me, unless it's going to come across my path again through some, you know. Uh, uh, felicitous happenstance. Uh, so mm -hmm. what I do is, is I, but I don't want to go and like, where's my notepad? Let me write this down real quick. What I want to do is I just want to send it to some place where it will be put in my face again in the near future. And to do that, I just email it to Evernote or to to Pinboard, which are the two sites that I check on whenever I want to research something. Is like, did I grab that in the past? Is this something that I came across? Because it sounds familiar. I'm not sure. That's the first place I look before going to Google because I've grabbed so many different bookmarks from just reading things and grabbing the interesting things and firing off an email to myself about it, rather than sending it to my Google inbox. Because my inbox is, as I'm sure yours is, Rob, it's crazy. You can't manage oh, that. You know, just to put a little flag on this and connect this back to our topic, what you're describing, it's kind of uh, off and on in my computing experience. I've had sort of like my self-Google thing where... Um, you know, desktop search or what have you, like uh, OSX comes with Spotlight, and then then uh, I use the heck out of things like Evernote and NVAlt, and um, I've had the urge now. I think one of my upcoming automations is going to be that, that kind of search where it's like the internal look before looking externally. Like, where did I come across that before? I know I t took a note or I saved an article, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think... Um, I think that'd be handy. Uh, I think so too. Yeah, if you, when you when you do it, uh, when you come up with that whatever automation you come up with, that please share it with the rest of us. Okay. <laughs> and and I think I got through everything here. I mean, I had some other things on my list like Dropbox, Box, uh, and Google Drive, and I use those with uh, if this then that for all my backup stuff to automate. You know what I'm actually pumping out to pump it back into my backups. Yeah, I mean, see, you, you mentioned being uh, concerned about connecting Google to um, if this, then that. Uh, I get that extreme, I get a fearful reaction when, when thinking about connecting, connecting it to my Dropbox. I mean, because that's like years of taking just so many notes and it's just, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, uh, good point, good point. I, I, I'm gonna, I will explore it, definitely, but uh, 
You do know that Dropbox launched two-step authentication recently, right? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I just I just read about it on my Flipboard. <laughs> so it's uh, like something you have and something you know. Like there's a fob, yeah. kind of thing. Yep, yep. It's okay. it. Yeah, you log in with your password, and then it, there, like there's an authentication app that you can run on your phone. So you can either get an authentication code via the app on your phone, or you can have it text you an authentication code. So I am can... way happy to hear this. Two-factor authentication on Evernote. Sweet. Oh, on Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox. Dropbox. Okay, that's cool too. Evernote would. I I actually wanted to hear it for Evernote. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> I will, I want to hear it for everything. I want to. I mean, yes. ever since I started using it for my Gmail, and it's not that big of a pain in the butt. I was scared to do it at first, but uh, now that I'm using it, it just it's it's. I, I shouldn't get too comfortable, but it does give me a little bit of peace of mind. Uh, yeah, it is more secure. Um, all right. Well. Uh, so okay, um, we got to get the takeaways. Yeah. Unless you had something else that you wanted to, to any other on the ground tools. No, not at all. I I think um, well, there's okay. Um, I'll just tease it one more time. I I really have um, all of Adobe's tools. They've got obviously the Actions palette. Actions palette's wonderful. And I've used the heck out of it both in Photoshop and in Illustrator. In Illustrator, you can do the data-driven version of it, and that's how like I made decks of cards and whatnot. I would imagine Ryan Estrada could make comics for the world with that feature. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone, no one else needs to make comics anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Between his coloring process and if he was powered with that, uh, <laughs> feeding the the writing right into the word balloons like that, I'd that'd be it. <laughs> he would have the output of Japan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so you know, every everyone be forewarned if that does does happen. Um, then then there's this other thing like worth worth considering that if you're getting getting into this, and I use the heck out of it for uh, when I update my art assets in Guitar Fretter, which I'm in the midst of because I'm adding some features and whatnot. So art that didn't exist in Guitar Fretter. Um, which is the game that I've, you know, I have on the uh, iOS uh, App Store and on the um, Google App Store App Market, Google Play, and uh, it's uh, it's essentially JavaScript that can connect to the given Adobe app, and each Adobe app has its own sort of browser-like DOM document object model that you can um, control it via JavaScript, and. Um, I've got one, for instance, that I use the heck out of, and we mentioned on the Lean Into, into Art cast before, with uh, um, it divides text. Um, it's called divide text or whatever. So I paste in text and, every, and, and uh, um, all each word balloon I want to be separated is just on a new line, right? And so I paste this into a, um, um, a resizable text field. Uh, I think it's called the, uh, oh, it's like the, a text area, or, or what have you. It's it's not your nor the standard text box, text box because it lets you um, resize it and it reflows the text. Right. But I I use this action and it divides that that into as many separate text elements as I need. So then I just move them around and I resize them quick, and then I can draw word balloons around real fast. And that's one example of one of these JavaScript automations that happens to, you know, be pre-built. Um, but you can make your own. And I did one uh, that I can go into detail at some point for the art and guitar fretter. But of course, that's actually based off of some other post that would that inspired me and stuff. So you know, credit where credits due. That was from the Corona, um, Anska Mobiles uh, um, makes the Corona SDK, and that's it was off of their blog. Yeah, I mentioned Corona in a while. Yeah, that's what that's the what powers Guitar Fretter. So Corona SDK. Okay, uh, wow, a lot of notes for this week's episode. Ah, uh, well, cool. Yeah, we can go into depth later on on those things, but uh, it's good to know that, that it's there. Like if you get yeah. you're you're just suspecting that you, if you have that pain too, where you're like, this is this is monotonous or whatever, you know. There's yeah. 
Adobe tools have a lot of power with that. So. Well, maybe that's maybe that's a, an, another episode to do. I mean, let's put that let's let's dog ear that one and possibly even do it next time. Okay. Because that sounds fascinating. I mean, the thing about Adobe tools that I think is really frustrating sometimes is it's victim to its own success in the sense that there's so many ways to do everything that even somebody who's been using it for 15, 17 years like me, I know I'm only using 10% of its resources or 10% of its abilities because I'm using it in the same way I've been using it for the past 10 years, right? Uh I'd be eager to be getting more out of the software that I paid so much money for before I switched to GIMP. <laughs> <laughs> I just downloaded and, a new version, and I'm, I'm eager to start playing with it and, uh, uh, for professional coloring. Yeah, and GIMP has a lot of... Auto- I have not automated anything in GIMP, but of course I've looked at it because I'm like, it, it, it must have the ability to be automated for me to use it seriously. So, anyway... Okay, so insert musical segue here, and then we get to takeaways. Takeaways, the segment where we talk about what's happened in the past week, not in the mundane, and then this happened, then this happened, but what's the takeaway? What's the story? What's the big idea uh, based on something that happened in our art week? Uh, The idea behind it is to demonstrate this notion that reflection bears fruit. Reflecting on what's been going on in your life, even when it seems like it's just been a mundane week, can often reveal something pretty interesting about what it is to be an artist and possibly, you know, it's the end of the Wonder Years. When Kevin turns to the camera and then you hear the guy's voice saying, that was a summer I'll never forget when my dad became, uh, you know, t- uh, said those words to me that said, you're no longer a boy, you're a man. That, that kind of moment is the takeaway moment, right? Yeah. So maybe I should insert the Wonder Years theme for uh, the musical segue for the segment. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, it, it w- and a- as long as we can hear it, so we could play along. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So who who goes first? You want to you want to go first? You, you you mentioned Jane McGonigal earlier. Oh sure. Yeah. It, it's uh, related to that. Um, it's so funny that um, I try to uh, mellow out mellow out my brain as I as I. Uh, go off to to sleep but actually um, I came across something that that I got really excited um, for some reason I started uh, just before going to bed started reading uh, uh, Jane McGonigal's uh, reality is broken on uh, on my Kindle or you know Kindle app on the iPad and um, the subtitle is uh, why games make us better and how they can change the world and uh, and I had been wanting to read this for ages. It's one of those books I've had sitting on my Kindle for months and months. And um, it, uh, I got really, okay, I don't know what, what, I just, I was hungry to, to, to get this, this kind of information. And I stayed up way, way, way later than I should have. Um, but I'm glad because I came across um, some, uh, a, ref, a re- interesting reflective thing that, by getting through Jane's, uh, some of her um, initial definitions of um, like, well, what is a game, right? So a game is, um, I'll, I'll do my best to, to wing it here, is it, it it is a set of voluntary obstacles that provides a feedback loop um, which we get to um, engage in the uh, act of, of um, feeling effective at practicing. A skill mm-hmm. because we're building to a, toward a goal and we have we have our autonomy because we're choosing to take on this obstacle and there's a lot of depth just within those basic elements that uh, that makes games um, a pretty powerful tool and she was citing interesting examples historical ones that I just never came across before which in with um, sort of the cause in human experience that brought games about which uh, it reminded me of the how um, when I was studying a, a little bit about the um, the function of humor and whatnot when I was working on the uh, 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 turning jokes into comics, laughing Yeti monkey spaghetti workshop um, is you know like where humor is a way for us to deal with the stress in the world and to you know turn it into something positive, and then games are a way for us to feel effective in the in the midst of stress in the world and I, and and then I came across 
um, you know, fast forwarding a little bit into the book, um, the idea that games can help us experience eustress, which I guess is the, the good form of stress. It's the kind where you're not necessarily um, developing an ulcer over, but you are challenged and you may be sweating this task before you. And I, I just went, uh oh, okay. How many hobbies or how, and interests do I have <laughs> that are about causing you stress? And that was my takeaway, where I'm like, uh, I, I guess I'm. This, this is a. I think I'm starting to characterize a kind of, um, I hyper interest slash addiction slash obsession thing. The, um, the art challenges, game development. Um, yeah, All you're that. you're addicted to what do they call that? Um, when you chuck the controller at the floor, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, rage monkey. Well, th 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 I thought there was a term for it, and see, this is where I'm I'm being like totally lame old guy, um, where you you chuck the controller, and everybody knows that that experience. Everybody knows that feeling. Like, oh, grew gosh, up. I remember. For me, it's I want to consume the soul of the controller like it is my enemy at this point where I feel so much hate where I'm like this controller must die and I think about putting it in my mouth and crushing it utterly <laughs> and then lifting out then this ghost will escape and I'll be I'll absorb its energy um, oh, see I thought you were going to take the metaphor all the way where like you crush it in your jaws and then you roll around the floor like an alligator <laughs> trying to break its neck I could, I that could happen at some point. I almost did when I was, uh, um, it, a, a very vivid memory, and that's the thing where these kind of game experiences can really stick with you like that. But it was um, trying to get past uh, the Eric Clapton Crossroads and Guitar Hero One on Expert, and I, I hit a wall. I hit one of those walls that you hit in games where it's like I can't get past this thing, yet I wouldn't stop trying to surmount it and um that's well the that's whole... the thing that's the thing the, the the throwing the controller at the floor feeling is a very you know uh potent and indelible feeling right we never forget that feeling we all know and, and so that's what i can say when i say like throwing the controller at the floor you can probably say that in like 25 different countries and people are like oh <laughs> i know what you're talking about exactly but, yeah. but nobody at least that i know of gets an ulcer from that right mm. um it's not the same as, oh my well, God, yeah. is my wife going to live or die, right? Oh, it's a yeah. completely different kind of stress. It's, it's a stress that is very, very frustrating and, and all-consuming, but there's something really low risk about it, you know? Where unless something's wrong with you, you're really not letting it get to you that much. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but, I mean, and you know, like, you volunteered for this. Yeah, yeah, it's not being put upon you. And and I think as a result, it's it's easier to walk away from it. Like when that Metroid Other M game was, when I hit that roadblock, I, I had the, the rage of throwing the controller at the floor kind of thing. And then after the third time of chucking the controller, I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm done. I don't have time to feel like this all the time. I've got other things to do, and I just want to enjoy this thing in a casual capacity, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but no, I've been right there with you. I mean, as a guy who spent... 20, 30, 40 hours on a single game in his lifetime, or in the past, not over the course of my whole lifetime, but there have been periods where I had time to game. And yeah, that's a very addictive feeling. And it's, I think it's cool that you're, you're characterizing your other works with that feeling as well, right? Because these are also things that you elected to do. So McGonagall, mm -hmm. uh, I'm also going to put a link in the show notes too. She did a TED Talk, did she not? Yeah. Yeah. And it may be centering around her thesis about reality is broken. Um, I mean, she's definitely caused a lot of rippling effects in the game industry regarding um, uh, people looking at games to uh, tackle serious tasks and make some kind of interesting, fun feedback loop around uh, non-traditional game experiences. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and the, the, those are examples of carrying out her her thesis of, of, well, reality is broken. We're, we have um, uh, a lot of situations where we aren't getting that kind of like voluntary obstacle stress. It's, it is a lot of the, you know, your work environment probably isn't optimized toward achieving optimal flow. Right. To, yeah. And she talks about like um, the, I think the epic win face in her TED Talk, right? Where she's showing that, like, there's that moment of like the the apex of the stress of the game, 
met by the unlocking of the thing that comes out of going through that stress cycle in the game, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what makes them so darn addictive. Um, in, 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 in her opinion, in a good way. Uh, one, and I remember in her TED talk, she, I think she even talks about like some games that are being harnessed, like game theory being harnessed to crowdsource solving world problems. If I remember right, it's been a couple years since. One offhand that I remember, just to, is is um, called Super Better, and I have not studied it or whatnot, but I, I've, it's evidently it's a site that if you are, um, you're essentially working to um, get let's see, to, to heal or, or conquer a disease or recover from some serious medical thing. And, um, and there's, I, I, and it may, I, I don't know what the gamut is, but I know like I've heard those kind of examples. It may be all the way down to, you know, um, setting fitness goals or whatnot, but I believe super better is more about having um, that kind of mindset to get the positive stress going and uh, feeling of, of, um, your own strengths and capabilities in the midst of being um, ill. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it's called Super Better. Super Better. I'm going to point people at one more link related to what you've been talking about, Rob. Um, mm -hmm. And you talked about, you know, humor being this thing that helps us deal with stress and, you know, uh, the, 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 the kind of stress cycle in games help us deal with real-life stress. Um, there was a great... WTF podcast. Uh, it's a comedy podcast with Mark Marin, and uh, it's really just an interview show. I think I mentioned it before on, on Lean Art Show. Uh, yeah, but he did an he did an episode. I'm pretty sure it was with, it was the WTF podcast. I'll look it up and I'll put it in the show notes. But it was an interview with David Letterman's ex wife, former head writer of the Letterman Show, and apparently she had a book that was coming out that was all about. I think its primary thesis was is that like if you have a messed up childhood where you don't get along with your family, that's like that's the perfect um, finishing school for becoming a comedian, because the only way to cope with all those childhood I don't want to say traumas, but like you know passive aggressive parents or you know uh, kind of complicated relationships with your siblings, the only way to get through that experience uh, and, and still be sane is to find the humor in it, to find the comedy in it. And so she talks about her stand-up career and how a lot of it was about uh, telling all these awful stories about her family. Uh, and again, awful relative term, but uh, you know, like just like uh, Kind of like the sitcom nonsense that happens in families, where uh, grand, you know, Uncle Uncle Jerry's drunk again. He puked in the boots, kind of thing, or mo Mom says mean things whenever she, whenever it's Mother's Day and everybody forgot or whatever. But um, but the the core idea that, she, that that I thought was the interesting one is that humor is not just like humor gets ca uh, categorized as uh, a device to attack or to do a, to send up or to satirize, right? Mm -hmm. uh, humor is an aggressive act. You're making fun of something, but humor can also be a tool to cope with something, right? To cope with a, this uh, unsatisfactory situation. So it was a, it was a neat kind of flipping on its head of that of the concept of humor, and I'll link to that. It's, it's, it was a really good listen. I found it fascinating. In any yeah, I, I I very much want that link. So yeah, that, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna skip past my takeaway because I think we we spent uh you know you brought a really good one and mine was gonna be like oh who knew that if you work with somebody you learn something so um I'll say that you no know restaurants have takeout menus <laughs> I, I didn't know that I'm totally joking. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, actually, for, for all history, that'll be known as your actual takeaway. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's set a wrap up. So you know what? Uh, thanks everybody for downloading and listening. We've got some news that we want to point. If you're listening to this or watching this video uh, before Wednesday, August 29th, twenty twelve. There's still time for you to participate in the live workshop at leanintoart.com slash workshops. Rack my book with uh, Tyler James of Comics Tribe and uh, TylerJamesComics.com. Uh, this guy did uh, the Absolute Consents workshop for us in the past and uh, really, really good stuff. Um, so what's Rack My Book? Rack My Book is uh, successful micro-distribution strategies for the independent publisher to get your books carried in more stores and therefore uh, in eventually into the hands of more readers. So uh, 
Tyler's a smart guy. He brings really great presentations, and there's going to be a Q&A after the presentation uh, that you might want to be a part of. So that's at leanintoart.com slash workshops. And the show, the presentation is live Wednesday, August 29th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. If you miss the live event, you can still get it after the fact because we're going to release it as a DRM-free video that you can uh, purchase in the workshops page. And uh, the, it, it's DRM-free, and the links never expire, so you can download it to your heart's content. So any other appearances you're going to be making, Rob? You're going to be at, um, what's it called? Um, Falcon. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm actually working on being at Falcon right now. And uh, I, uh, that's not guaranteed yet. I would love to be part of Falcon and or SpringCon. But um, yeah, somehow I just haven't been able to uh, uh, make that connection yet. So um, hey, any local Minneapolis folks um, know of uh, how to you know, continue through that process or want to share a table with me? Hey, <laughs> I'd be into that. <clears throat> Um, and then actually um, uh, coming up in early September, September 6th, 13th, and 20th, I'll be doing um, Underwater Tomato Ninja at oh. Moving to Art, also available on the workshops page. And uh, you sign up for that. That's uh, three sessions. Two of them will be live. The middle one, and, and that'll be like the, the main, it's, a, it's a, essentially the workshop is an experience of you know, going through a bunch of topics, but in the style of a game to make a game, and then the middle one is like a side quest, and that's where you know we'll just we'll hang we'll chat in the forums and all that stuff, and uh, you can download that video, which will be pre-recorded. And but, through this workshop, you will learn how to make a game in HTML5, right? Yeah. Well, hey Rob, guess what? Adobe Flash. I don't need to learn HTML5. Oh wait, they're they're deprecating Adobe Flash and all of the mobile devices nowadays, aren't they? Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> so, so this H there might be a future to this HTML5 stuff, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe, kid. You just keep working at it. It uh, absolutely. I mean, it's essentially it's the open standards approach that um, all the modern browsers are are supporting most all aspects of it. Yeah, there's little nuances here and there, but there's there's workarounds, yeah. and um, it's essentially yeah, just uh, JavaScript plus CSS3 plus um, uh, you know, new H, um, new essentially. Uh, gosh, it's a whole family of of features that uh, uh, related to like the performance of browsers and um, local storage uh, and all. I mean, just a ton of things that where like a browser is is not just this thing to like go fetch documents anymore. It's an it's an application platform, and that's a that's a different. Uh, we're in a different era. So, uh, one way to take advantage of that is uh, making games. This is true. You know, we're we're recording this show in a browser window right now. So there you go. I my, my god, that that is wild, isn't it? Oh god, just thinking 5 years ago, you know, uh 7 years ago, this this would have been indistinguishable from magic to me. So anyway, uh yeah, underwater tomato ninja could be found at leanintoart.com/workshops as well. There's a whole mess of workshops in there you guys should check out and see if 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 what we've just talked about doesn't sound like it's to your liking. Look at the other stuff in there. There's a whole bunch of other things you can check out that you can download or purchase and, purchase and download today that helps support the show, helps keep us in the black, helps us pay for the software we use to run the site. Uh, obviously this Google Plus recording setup is free, but it costs money to host the site, it costs money to run the software, to run the workshops, so uh, yeah, it'd be a great way to support us, uh, and you mm -hmm. get something in return, uh, value for value. So uh, the other appearances, I'm going to be at SPX, the Small Press Expo, September 15th and 16th, that's at spexpo.com. Uh, if anybody wants to see me do a little talking, I'm hosting the Ignatz Awards, I'm incredibly honored to be uh, the host of the Ignatz Awards this year, uh, and I've got, I, I haven't made public the list of presenters yet, but I got a pretty stellar list of presenters for this thing. It's going to be a fun present, or fun event, fun award ceremony. I wish I was going. It sound, I mean, that would just, yeah, that sounds like a ton of fun. I, I, I think it's going to be fun. I mean, Krishna Sadasavam is going to be there. Uh, Casey Van awesome. Heis is going to be there. Super uh, cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun show. It's my third time going. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about going this year. Interesting. Uh, uh, two other people who have workshops that lean, lean into art. Just, you know, worth mentioning. 
Both Krishna. <laughs> well, it, it, it couldn't Casey. possibly it couldn't possibly have been a strategic maneuver for me to mention those names on the show. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that's at spexpo.com. If you're going to be in the Bethesda, Maryland area, uh, stop on by. Uh, you know, I'm I am not too big to uh, to shy away from somebody saying, "Oh, Jersey Dros, thank God." I'm still waiting for that experience. So um, the other things that I wanted to make uh, notes about, uh, there's one more thing actually, and this is just helping out a pal, Raina Telgemeier of uh, GoRaina.com. Her book's coming out this Saturday, and it's called Drama. I read it. Rob, have you read it yet? You got. I haven't it, read right? it. I. <clears throat> that wasn't. Of, I, I was excited to see copies get. Uh, or there was sort of those uh, early copies that people could win at uh, Kids Read Comics, and. Uh, that was fun to watch other people win those things, but <laughs> I, and uh, hey, I can't wait for it. I mean, yeah, smile. Uh, yeah, I've already gushed about that a lot, and uh, can't wait to uh, to read drama. I think drama is superior to smile in several ways. I don't want to do a, a, a apples to apples comparison since it's a different kind of book, but mm -hmm. it's it's an incredible piece of comics fiction, and uh, I'm writing this down. Drama day, so. Um, yeah, uh, you can win a chance to be, uh, or rather, you can enter to win to be a guest on the Comics Are Great show with me and Raina by participating in the Drama Day contest. And how do you do that? Uh, get a picture of yourself holding the book in a bookstore on the day of release, Saturday, September 1st. I think the, the Raina's extending the contest out through September 8th. Post that picture on the uh, Raina Telgemeier's Facebook page. I'll post the link in the show notes to the contest rules. And then you can either win some original Raina Telgemeier art, you can win a guest spot on the Comics A Great Show with me and Raina, or you can get a Smile t-shirt, which is also pretty cool. So uh, the, the the rules are at GoRaina.com if you don't have a, you know, if, if, if you don't want to go to the show notes, but the link will be in the show notes. You've got till September 8th, but the book comes out September 1st, and I'm just trying to get the word out to try to help do whatever little bit I can to help uh, propel uh, awareness of this book on release day. It, it'd be, if, 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 if Santa, if you're listening, what I'm hoping for is that Drama Day, the hashtag, becomes a trending topic on September 1st, and it becomes a New York Times best-selling book on day one. That's what I would wish for for Christmas this year, Santa. Are you listening? Super cool. But uh, it's, it's in, I wouldn't push this so hard unless I really believed in the book. This isn't just me saying, like, oh, I like Raina, so I'll just try to put it. It's a crappy book, but she's my friend. You know, it's, it's really a, an amazing book regardless of what your tastes are. Just if, it's, if your goal is just pure analysis of the comics form, it's good for that. But if you're also looking for just, like, a really, really solid, crafted tale, it's good for that, too. So it's a great book. GoRaina.com. Super awesome. Can't wait for that book. You have a copy already, I know. But I have a pre-pub. I've read it, I think, uh, three or four times now. Uh, I was reading it today for Read Comics in Public Day. So, uh, which happens to be Jack Kirby's birthday. Happy birthday, Jack. Uh, mm -hmm. So, anyway, okay. Anything else? Or can we go home? This, I this, think we're good. I think we, uh, we, we did our first new format. Um, Iteration is is uh, something we'll always be into, and uh, we'll see if we, we get uh, little stingers and, and uh, fun music transitions and stuff. But uh, it was good. Um, you know, I, I I'm curious. Uh, by all means, ping us on Twitter or ping us uh, um, uh, in in comments or, or or in the forums at Lean Into Art. And if if you uh, if you kind of dig this this flow, and and also um, yeah, the the I'll, I'll admit, I think I prattled a little bit on a couple of the segments, but uh, you know, threw us off. We're, we're, our target is an hour, but I'm also curious. Like, um, how do you guys feel about that? The 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 podcast length thing. Yeah. Why not? Why not have that conversation? I'm curious. All right, you asked for it, Rob. I've had this conversation before with folks in the past, and it always goes fifty fifty down the middle of people saying take as long as you want, and then other people saying hour or less every time. I'm anticipating that will be the answer we get, but we'll see. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're, we're shooting for tighter shows. But um, yep. but yeah, we ran a little long on this one, but no big. But yeah, uh, and and the format is going to iterate. I mean, we've got a structure, but uh, in terms of like polishing it up, that that will happen with time. 
I do want to do musical segues into the different segments. And cool. I, as soon as I figure out how to do that, uh, hey, here's where I can put out a call to help everybody. Talk about like getting resources on how to learn things. I'm going through my bookmarks trying to find the tutorial on this. If anybody out there knows how to pump music files into a Google Plus Hangout and simultaneously record it in Audio Hijack Pro, that'd be really cool. Anybody's got that... Uh, the, that information just sitting around, you can fire it our way at leanintoart at gmail.com. And the link, that link will be posted again or, or mentioned again in the closing music. So, hey, Rob, thanks a lot for this discussion. This was fun. My pleasure, Jersey. Thanks a lot for um, reworking our format. I dig it. I, 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 I had some good use stress going, so thanks. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, well, thank you, everybody, for downloading, listening, and watching in the live stream. We will be back next Tuesday at 9.15 p.m. Eastern Time on the Google Pluses. You can find it at google.com slash plus Jersey Drost for now until we get the Lean into Art, uh, you know, address. And until then, I have been Jersey Drost of comicsaregreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com and... Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. And I'm going to end the broadcast, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. Super cool. Hope you don't mind me joking around with you there, Ryan. <laughs> Thank you, Rock, and you're very productive. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. See you guys. I will let you know, Ryan, as soon as I find out how to do that. All right, ending broadcast. And ending recording. So, okay, Rob. Oh, wait. See if the broadcast is ended. Come on.